Welcome. Wow, what an unusual time we live in. And uh, I'm glad we have some creativity and some wonderfully talented folks. And modern technology enables us to continue our walk through Acts. I hope all of you are staying safe uh, and at home and uh, just doing essential stuff out and about and that sort of a thing. I just want to thank Rolene and others who have uh, really rallied to enable the Engage Bible Study to continue. Uh, as we march our way through Acts, we're going to do this. Where we're going to keep recording these, even if they allow us to get back together. We'll go ahead and record them each Wednesday, so that way you can view them if you need to travel and head back to other places and that sort of stuff. So uh, we're at Acts chapter 22, and I know that interruption of the story, so go back and read Acts 21 uh, before you get to 22. Remember that Paul is in Jerusalem. He's at the temple and uh, he's been accused of smuggling a Gentile into the inner court of men, and a riot has broke and broken out, and the Romans have come in from the Antonio Fortress, and they've seized him, and they've gotten him out of harm's way, get to the top of the stairs of the Antonio Fortress, and then Paul asks for permission to turn and address uh, the Jewish folks who are gathered there who are in the riot. He manages to get them quieted down, and 22 begins with his uh, speech now, if you will, uh, his defense, as he calls it in, in Acts, uh, and it is addressed to the people, and it is done in Hebrew. So our opening line here, well, let's pray before we get going. So let's pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Fathers, we come before you today. Calm our hearts, calm our nerves, but renew us as well. Give us renewed strength and vitality. I thank you for all the people who, who even in this time, still want to know you and your word and want to go deeper into it. I pray your blessing upon them as they meet in their core groups through Zoom and other ways. And gracious Heavenly Father, that uh, we would all be enriched during this time. So uh, may you speak and may we hear and respond. So it's in your name. Amen. Okay, so Acts chapter 22. The first verse, when Paul addresses uh, the rioters and all there at the temple court, he says, brothers and fathers. Now, that's intentional because the riot really started in the inner court, the court of where the men were allowed. So the men are the ones who have seized him and are dragging him out and uh, beginning to try and beat him and all that sort of stuff. So he's now addressing them, brothers and fathers. Hear the defense that I now make before you. Now, he's speaking in Hebrew, and that word here is Shema, and it's a famous uh, word uh, for the Jewish people, going back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, uh, which is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, is, the Lord is one. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Achad. So, it's sort of their statement of faith. In many of our traditions, it'd be like the Apostles' Creed, if he started to say that. So, if he says, Shema, Shema, oh, He's speaking not only in Hebrew, but he's using a word that's very important to us and very dear. Hear, hear, O Israel. Uh, brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. So Paul then, uh, addressing them in Hebrew, the first thing that he does is he's, he wants to let them know who I am. So he, he's introducing himself. Let me tell you who I am. And, and he begins by letting them know that he is a Jew born in Tarshish, uh, and, but he was brought up in Jerusalem and, and that he studied under the great uh, Gamaliel. And so uh, he's a well-educated, deeply devout person is what he's revealing to them. And he says to them, I too was zealous for God as you all are this day. It's amazing. Paul is affirming their zeal for God. I don't know about you, but if I had just been in the midst of a riot where people trying to beat me up and that sort of stuff, I don't know if I'd be in, <laughs> in any kind of mood or condition to affirm anything in those folks. Uh, instead, I'd be wanting to call down fire from heaven and all kinds of things like that. But Paul is able to make this connection uh, uh, with them. And he says, I identify and I recognize and see your zeal for God, even in this activity, in this riot. And I, I, I want to talk about that zeal for God because I shared in that. And I still sh have that commonality with you as well. And he goes on to say, my zeal for God was, and the faith was so great that I actually persecuted these people of this way. Now we've talked about in Acts how uh, Christians were initially known as people of the way. 
and you know, the Gospel of John, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The way. We are the people of the way. But it was in Antioch uh, that we first became known as Christians. So Paul is still talking about, I persecuted this way, this group of people, to death. Uh, and so he's very explicit about his own passion and his own zeal for the Lord and his Judaism and his his education and growing up in uh, Jerusalem. And, and he even says, look, even the Jewish council can verify everything that I've told you because I got papers and documents from them. So at this point in time, the Jewish folks have calmed down and they're, okay, you're one of us. Okay, you are passionate about persecuting people of this way. Paul then switches, and, and after he's introduced and says, who am I, he now goes to this question, who are you? And, and it comes about, that question comes about uh, in his telling of his conversion experience on the road to Damascus. So picking up in verse 6, as I was on my way and drew near to Damascus. Now, I believe that's an intentional contrast that's being made by Paul in his speech. I used to persecute people of this way because I was on my way. And all of us want to be on our own way, but we need to be on the way of Jesus. And so Paul is acknowledging that he persecuted people of this way because he was on his own way. All of us have sinned and gone astray from the Lord, or as often is said in the Old Testament, uh, each person did what was right in his or her own eyes. And we go astray. We go our own way. We are very proud in our culture of uh, being self-made men and women. And we will determine for ourselves what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is evil, uh, whether we want to do this or that. Uh, we are very proud to be self-determined individuals. And so Paul, I believe, is picking up on that as well. I was on my way and drew near to Damascus. About noon, he says, a great light shone around me. Now, when he says noon, that's important because he wants us to know that the sun is at its peak. It is giving its most light that it can give to the earth at that time. So for some other light to come around you, it had to be brighter than greater than the sun that was shining in the noon sky. And so I, I like to put the word great er there, uh, about noon, a great er light from heaven suddenly shone around me. Because that's the point he's trying to make, that it, it, no natural phenomenon, especially at that time, could put that kind of light around him. He knew it was from heaven. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So Paul's first encounter with the Lord is this great light, but also this great question. Why are you persecuting me? Why are you grieving me? Why are you doing these things to me? And it's a penetrating question. And I believe it's one that God gets into our hearts at times, uh, at least I can tell you in my life. He's, you know, Jim, why are you grieving me so? Why are you persecuting me by the way that you're treating other people and the way you're living your life and your selfishness? Why are you persecuting me? Uh, now, I haven't actually gone out and tried to kill anybody like Paul did, uh, but uh, I think at times we do grieve the Lord to his heart. And so this first question that is asked to Saul is, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? Now, Almost every translation has that word Lord in a capital L. It can also be a lowercase l, and it can also be translated more as sir. So how you translate that, there's some debate and discussion, but the vast majority of folks and the vast majority of the translations, if you look in your Bible, are going to have a capital L there. And they've made a decision that when uh, Paul is talking and says Lord here, he means the Lord of Lords, King of Kings. There have been folks who've questioned that, and they've questioned it because um, does Paul really recognize at that point that this is the Lord, or is he not sure if it's an angel or something else? And so 
Is it more Lord, lowercase, or should it be more of Sir? In Hebrew, the word Adonai can actually be used for all of those. So if he is speaking Hebrew, he would be saying Adonai, which again ties into the Shema, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Ahad. But Adonai is the Lord, capital L. In fact, if you go to Deuteronomy, you're going to find it's all capitals, all capitals for the name of God. So is this sort of a play on words? How is Paul intending it as he's telling it to the rioters? How did Paul mean it when he first spoke it? How did the people who have been rioting hear him when he said Adonai at that point? Uh, is a question and debate. And part of that debate uh, is also because in our various traditions, um, uh, some of us really love uh, instantaneous conversion, where somebody's just driven to the ground and falls on their knees and recognizes and declares, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And others of us come from traditions where uh, it's a process that a person goes through. And, and so some of the debate that comes in here is that we come to scriptures with our own preconceived notions or ideas which maybe bias us one way to another where Paul's already here, who are you, Lord? He's already acknowledging, I know who you are. You're the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. Others are, no, this is Paul beginning a journey of conversion. And you know what? I'm going to leave that to you to wrestle with. What we know is in scripture, God does both and can do it all as he wishes. So if Paul is instantaneously converted or it's a process here, I leave that to you. At any rate, the Jewish folks keep paying attention to him as he continues to give his testimony. And he says, the response that he got is, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Wow, the Lord's response is humility. Humility at that very point. He could have said, I am the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Alpha and the Omega. I am the maker of the heavens and the earth. I am the great I am. He just says, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. His humanity is really emphasized. I am Yahshua of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And so the Lord's response, even in Paul's conversion, is an amazing thing, the humility of the Lord. And we just celebrated Palm Sunday uh, and that Jesus came lowly riding on a donkey. Here again, he's not there to drive fear. He's to draw people in. And he's trying to draw people in. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now it's acknowledged, Paul says, that those who were with him saw the light, but they didn't understand the voice. They didn't understand the words uh, that are coming out. And again, some folks say this as uh, an angelic or heavenly language, uh, kind of like perhaps speaking in tongues, where Paul is given the ability to hear and interpret. Again, I'm going to leave that with you to wrestle with, or if it's just God and his sovereignty saying, I'm speaking to you and not to them at this moment because you're the one that's persecuting me. Uh, so I'm going to allow you to wrestle with all of that. Uh, so this great light in all this conversion experience, as a result, he can no longer see, he is blind, and he is dependent upon those people around him who get him into Damascus, and there we're introduced to Ananias. Now, what we know about Ananias is that he's a devout Jew, uh, follows the law, and he's well spoken of by the Jewish community in Antioch, and he comes and stands by Paul and says, brother, receive your sight and he does. So you can go back and read in more detail Paul's conversion in earlier chapters in Acts. The part that gets added here that's really of interest to, to us is that Paul receives his commission at that point in time. And that commission comes in verse 14. The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on this name. 
So Paul's commission here is where God is saying, I'm not just simply trying to convert you, I'm commissioning you uh, to do mission and ministry. And his commission is to go out and to be a witness for the righteous one, which again will get you asking the question, who is that? Oh, Jesus. Um, and and uh, the voice that you have heard from his mouth is the voice that came from Jesus. And you will be a witness for him, that is Jesus, to everyone of what you have seen and heard. I love that the scripture just simply says, Paul, I just want you to share with people what you have seen and what you heard. Paul doesn't have to try and speculate and go into all kinds of things that he has not seen or heard or experienced with the Lord. Just we tell people what you have seen and heard the Lord. And we too, to this day, as Christians, are to be his witnesses. When we are converted, we are also commissioned. And we are commissioned to be his witnesses and just to tell people what we have seen and what we have heard of Jesus. And you and I are doing that every time we listen to scripture. We are listening for his word. And every time we are in prayer, we are opening ourselves. May we therefore with everyone that we meet, as Paul is here, everyone, share what we have seen and what we have heard. And then why do you wait? What's the hesitation? Rise and be baptized and wash away the sins, calling on his name, which again takes you back to Jesus, the name I am Jesus of Nazareth. Call on the name of Jesus. Paul then continues his testimony about what God did in his life, and he talks about, in verse 17, when I had returned to Jerusalem, so he now returns to Jerusalem from Damascus, he comes back to Jerusalem, he was praying in the temple, and he fell into a trance. That is, he himself was spending time in prayer and meditation in the temple, uh, and God gives him a vision. Uh, they have a conversation, which the apostle Paul is saying, you know, Lord, I realize people want me to get out of Jerusalem quickly because I've been converted and I have this commission. Uh, yet, you know, they know that I persecuted people. They might imprison me. It's that old song, should I stay or should I go, kind of a thing. And then at the very end there, it's 21, it says, and he, God, said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Okay. Once that phrase happens, the folks who had been in riot, who had then calmed down, went into riot again. And the phrase is, up to this word, they listened to him. Now, it could be the specific word at the very end of that statement, which is Gentiles. Because if you remember, the accusation that had been made against Paul was that he had brought a Gentile into the temple court and to the inner part of the temple court. That was part of the reason why they're in a riot. So now that Paul brings up that word Gentiles, it, it is that word that triggers them again, as if, see, everything that we've been accusing him of is true. He just admitted it. He's for Gentiles. So realize that there's a disconnect, but in their heads, it's a confirmation. So one way to take it is at that word, Gentile, the riot broke out. Another way to take it at, up to the word they listened to him, meaning up to that point, they had become more and more agitated as he went along, and that was just the final straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, I leave that to you, and the op obvious option is that both of them are true, and both are real, and both need to be understood. But uh, definitely the word Gentiles, uh, they weren't angry when he talked about Jesus. They weren't angry when he talked about being baptized in his name. They didn't go into riot then. They went into riot when he talked about Gentiles. So that's when the riot broke out. Uh, all right. And at that point in time, uh, the Roman soldier grabs him, hauls him off to the barracks, and decides, you know, well, we have a way of figuring out the truth. Uh, we're going to do a special kind of examination on you called flogging. So the examination by flogging. Uh, and there's still folks who believe uh, the way you really get to the truth out of somebody is to torture them. And, and if you beat them and do all kinds of horrible stuff to them, they'll finally tell you the truth. Uh, of course, we also realize that sometimes the opposite happens. They'll say whatever they need to say to get that torture to end. But the Roman soldier at this point in time believes that if they flog him, 
they will get the truth out of him of why the riot's going on, what's really going on. And in large part, if you recall back in chapter 21, the Roman soldier is concerned that we have another insurrector here who is coming in to stir up the Jews and have a revolt uh, going on. And so he's concerned that maybe Paul is bringing about a revolution. And so he just wants to get the truth. Uh, and we're going to do that by whipping and flogging him. Uh, Paul is then bound and all set to be flogged. And at that point in time, he said, so you're going to do this to a Roman citizen. And at that point in time, the folks who are flogging him panic because if you're a Roman citizen, you cannot be bound, you cannot be uh, whipped or a judge sentence given against you without proper due process. In other words, yes, it would have been fine if, if Paul was not a Roman soldier for that uh, officer to have done that. Uh, but because Paul now is claiming, I am a Roman citizen, the whole thing kind of comes to a stop and the soldiers rush back to their commander and say, look, if he's a Roman citizen and we do this, we get in trouble and you are going to get in trouble. And so he comes back in and he asks Paul, are you a Roman citizen? And Paul says, uh, yes. And he said, I got mine by buying mine. I bought my citizenship. How did you get yours? And Paul said, I got mine by birth. Now, there's some interesting uh, parallels here and differences to Jesus' story in Jerusalem as well in the end days of his life. Uh, some commonalities with this. Uh, obviously, both are in Jerusalem. Uh, both involve flogging at some point in time. Both have in them the question, are you? Uh, to Jesus, the question, are you the king of the Jews? Uh, to Paul, it's, are you a Roman citizen? Uh, so, and both are obviously by birth, that's made clear in Matthew and Luke, that by birth Jesus is the Son of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and John, uh, from the dawn of creation, uh, he's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And also now Paul, by birth, I am a Roman citizen. So the birth thing is there as well. Both involve Roman authority and the council, which gets called together, but the order doesn't, isn't the same, and I don't think there's an intention to make them the same. It's just one of those intriguing similarities, but the more we push the similarities, the, the, the more it can seem like it was contrived, and I don't believe it was contrived. Uh, it's just one of those, wow, isn't that interesting that they have these things in common as well. And again, there are differences. Obviously, Paul was not flogged, Jesus was. Uh, the other difference is that uh, Paul's began with the Roman authority and then went to the council, where Jesus began with the council and then went to the Roman authority. So there's no direct parallel in lining up. But I just point those things out to you. So the question I think that all this leaves us is, uh, first of all, just some wonderful story about Paul's encounter and his willingness to give his testimony to people, even when folks are upset with him, and it might be safer for him not to, uh, and just to say, hey, I'm a Roman citizen, and that would have ended it all right at the very beginning. But instead, Paul is committed to sharing his testimony, to being a witness, to giving a defense, and that has been a theme throughout Acts is people's willingness to be a witness for Jesus Christ. And that calls us to go, wow, Lord, am I willing to be a witness for you, even in the midst of difficult times? And we are definitely in the midst of difficult times. So how can we be witnesses? And for that, perhaps like Paul, we need to spend time in prayer and meditation and reflection. And we need to ask the Lord, Lord, will you reveal to us uh, how we can be a witness for you, Jesus Christ at this time. Well, that's all I have for you for Acts chapter 22. Uh, I hope you had great conversations in your uh, core groups and look forward to seeing you next week. Let's just close them with prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord, if Paul had not been willing to bear witness to you, we would not know and we would not have the scriptures and know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior the way that we do. We thank you for his willingness to be a witness. And Lord, we pray that in this day, and especially at this time, that we would be witnesses as well. So bless all, whether they're at home, where they're still able to get to 
the store or do some things, Lord, I pray that we would at all places and at all times bear witness to Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.